So our speaker tonight is Professor Mariangelo Lazanti, an assistant professor at the Department of Physics at Princeton University. You'll see that her accomplishments are so large that I need a cheat sheet to keep track of them all. Uh, she's been a star since she was a high school student. She won several awards. She was included in the MIT Technological Review's TR35 list of the world's top innovators under 35 in 2002. Uh, she did undergraduate studies at Harvard, <coughs> then she moved to Stanford where she earned a PhD in theoretical physics in 2010, working on topics including the physics of the Large Hadron Collider, the Higgs boson, and the particle physics of dark matter. From there she went to Princeton as a postdoctoral researcher until 2013, where they realized that they couldn't possibly let her go, and so they recruited her to join the faculty there in the Department of Physics. She's uh, continued to win impressive awards, including a Sloan Research Fellowship and the Cottrell Scholar Award. Tonight, she's gonna share with us some of her recent exciting research at the interface between astronomy and particle physics, using observations to learn about the mysterious dark matter that makes up most of the matter in the universe. All right, thank you so much, Tim. Uh, thank you, and, and welcome. Uh, thanks for coming out. It's such a beautiful evening in, in Aspen tonight, um, so it's, uh, it's an honor that, that you've decided to, to come here to this lecture. So, um, before we, we start, um, some of you have gotten a, a sheet that looks like this. Um, so it's going to be a random sampling of the audience members. Uh, and I thought um, we could get some practice with it before the actual talk gets started. So the idea behind this is there's going to be some random points in the course of the talk where I want to crowdsource your intuition on, on some problems. And um, just to kind of warm up, I thought we could get started with um, a non-physics question. So I'm going to put a question up. And um, if you take your sheet, and uh, each answer is going to be a different color. So fold the sheet so that the color that's your answer is showing up in front, and then hold it up. And then I'm going to try by eye to sort of tally across the audience what our spread in answers is. So to start off, um, I wanted to learn a little bit about uh, you, the audience members. So um, show me red if you're a Colorado native, uh, green if you're from out of state, yellow if you're from out of the country, or blue if you're from out of the galaxy. <laughs> uh, all right, so a couple seconds to kind of fold. Wow, interesting. OK, so majority is actually green, and uh, red comes in uh, thereafter. We don't have any aliens in the audience, which I was kind of counting on, because then you could have helped me with the rest of the talk. Um, so welcome. Uh, and uh, keep those handy because there will be a couple other points in the talk where we'll, we'll use them. So as Tim said, what I want to do over the course of the next hour is tell you a little bit about the mysteries of dark matter, um, what it is, why we believe it exists, and how we're out searching for it. Um, the story I'm going to tell you really breaks down into three sub-stories. Uh, so we're going to start off with the theme of gravity because all of the evidence that we have for the fact that the majority of the universe is invisible to us, comes from gravity. So we need to start back in the 1600s from, with Newton. Um, once we, we understand what's motivating uh, evidence for dark matter, we're going to move to discussing what kinds of searches, what kinds of experimental searches people are designing that are running here on Earth, trying to detect this particle and understand its fundamental properties. Um, and one important component of that is going to be mapping the dark matter, creating a very intricate map of the dark matter in the Milky Way. Um, and this is actually um, the topic of one of the workshops being held here at the Aspen Center uh, for the next three weeks or so. So some subset of the physicists that you see roaming around the grassy areas have been thinking about this question. Uh, and we'll be continuing to think about that for the next few weeks. So uh, let's begin, though, with gravity and going back to the time of Newton. Uh, so in the 1600s, Newton explained that there's a gravitational pull between two massive objects. And it's this gravitational pull that keeps the planets in our solar system in orbit around the sun. Uh, so this is a familiar picture of our solar system where each of these planets, where its motion is governed by these laws that were put forth by Newton centuries ago. Um, these laws have been tested so well that when we see deviations from them, that typically ends up pointing to the fact that there's some interesting new phenomena we don't understand. Uh, and an example within our own solar system uh, is the discovery of Neptune. So the way Neptune was uh, discovered was in observations of Uranus's orbit. And because the orbit 
um, showed deviations from the Newtonian prediction, uh, people posited that there could potentially be another planet further away uh, that as it passed by uh, close to the to planet Uranus sort of perturbed it a little bit, gave it a little kick, and that's what um, we were seeing. Uh, and indeed, uh, several years after that, uh, that hypothesis was made, the actual planet was discovered. Uh, so this is a really nice example where we see that uh, we can use uh, the Newtonian gravity and the, uh, its predictions to actually discover new phenomena. So this is a story on the scale of the solar system. Let's zoom out a lot more. So here we are, Earth around the sun, but now let's consider what happens when we have the sun rotating around the center of the Milky Way. Uh, so this disk here is the visible part of our galaxy, uh, artistic representation. Um, and uh, here's our sun. So we're located very far away from the center of the Milky Way. We're essentially out in the suburbs. Uh, and we're moving uh, at about 440,000 miles an hour around the center of the galaxy. Uh, so we're far out in the outskirts, moving at a fairly rapid clip. Uh, and you know, here's Earth going around the sun. So we can now apply some of the same uh, ideas that were applied to the solar system and, and the extrapolation uh, from Uranus and prediction for Newton to understanding the dynamics of our own galaxy. So let's go through the exercise now of understanding how Newtonian gravity makes predictions for objects as we move from close to the center of the galaxy to far away. So uh, I'm not going to actually go through the theory of Newton's laws. I'm just going to tell you very generally uh, what it depends on. So uh, when we have two massive objects, so this could be, for example, the sun and the Earth orbiting around the sun, or all of the mass in the Milky Way interior to where the sun is, uh, the speed of the object that's orbiting around depends on both the mass that's enclosed and the distance between the two. Um, and the, it depends on these two quantities in a way such that the speed will decrease if I decrease this mass, um, and it'll also decrease if I increase the separation between the two. Um, and for everything we're going to talk about, this is essentially the two sets of relations that you'll need to know. So let's take this and apply it to the case of two stars um, that are orbiting around the Milky Way. So I've put star A here. Uh, it's closer to the center than star B is. And the question is, which of these two should be moving at a greater speed according to Newton's laws? Um, so let's look at this a bit more carefully. Uh, B is located farther from the center of the galaxy. And um, as we saw on the previous slide, that should imply that B is moving with a, a lower speed. Now you might argue, well, there's also more mass that's enclosed, because now I'm further out and I'm enclosing more mass of the Milky Way. But it turns out that uh, that additional mass isn't enough to compensate for the reduction in speed. And so at the end of the day, it does turn out that uh, Newton's law does predict that B should be moving more slowly. And if we did this exercise looking at all of the distances and made um, a plot of what the rotation speed of the star should look like um, relative to the distance from the center of the galaxy, uh, it looks something like this green line. And so star A, which was located close, is around here, and star B is located there. So again, star B would be moving more slowly. So all that's been put into this green line is the basics of Newton's laws, essentially everything we know since the 1600s, and some assumption about how the mass in the Milky Way is distributed. So we're really relying on basic physics here. So this is our prediction. We can go out, we can do this measurement. Um, that's been done, and this is what's actually measured. Um, so instead of the rotation speed decreasing, it actually flattens out. Uh, and that's essentially telling us that the motion of any star that's located uh, out here on the edge of the galaxy is greater than anything you would expect from Newton's predictions. Um, so to sort of drive home the point, here's a little movie that shows two rotating galaxies, one where the motion is dictated solely by Newtonian gravity, and the other one where it's what we actually observe. And so you can see very clearly here that the differences become quite striking when you look towards the edge of the galaxy, that the gas and the stars that are out on that outer rim are actually moving much faster. Now I want to underline that doing these kinds of measurements and observations is extremely challenging. 
So the first set of rotation curve measurements were done in the 1930s. And the first hints that there could be this sort of anomalous behavior was already there from, from that point in time. But the measurements just weren't good enough, and nobody really believed them. Uh, and so it wasn't until the 1970s that the observations became really good. And that was really due to pioneering work by Vera Rubin. Um, and so she had several of these major papers that came out in 1970s and the early 1980s that really solidified this. Um, at the time, she had chosen to work on this particular area because it wasn't a hot topic. There weren't a lot of people working on it. Most people thought it was boring. And so she thought that that allotted her some freedom to just be creative and do her own thing. And uh, in, in that choice, she ended up uh, making an observation that has uh, confused scientists ever since. So it's a pretty incredible story. Um, she unfortunately passed away a few years ago, but even up until that time, there was no answer to what exactly was causing this anomalous behavior that she observed. Um, and I love this quote from her um, because she sort of acknowledges that uh, we don't know the answer, but that's actually where all the fun is, uh, trying to figure out and uh, test out ideas and, and sort things out. Um, so it's a, it's, a really, it's a really wonderful story. Um, so as, as noted here, right, there's, um, there's kind of two main hypotheses for what may be going on here. Uh, and I want to explore those a little bit um, here with you. So the first is, well, OK, maybe we've encountered our first example where Newton's laws just fail. And we need to go back and revise our theory. Um, and a lot of people have tried doing that. It just it turns out that it's really hard to make it work with observations. So every time you write down a new theory, you, know, you go off in your office, you scribble on a pad of paper, you get really excited because you have your eureka moment. But then the next step is you have to make some prediction and then look at, at uh, some observable and see if it's consistent with your prediction. Um, and so this has been done now with many modifications to, to Newton's theory of gravity. And it turns out it's, it's a hard problem to make work, given our observations. Um, there's a whole variety of tests that have been done. Um, one simple one that's sort of easy to, to describe is that in many of these modified gravity theories, they tend to predict that the stars near the sun should be moving with, a large, uh, with large speeds. Um, so we can go out and measure the speeds of those stars, and it's a lot smaller than what's predicted from the, these, uh, these modifications. And so it's in the, these observations are, tend to be inconsistent with these proposed theories. Um, it doesn't mean that these theories are completely excluded yet. It may be that we just haven't had the right idea yet, but it seems hard to make this work. Um, the other option, if we're going to uh, say that it's not a modification of gravity, uh, is to go back to our thinking about Uranus's orbit around the center of the, our sun, right? So there, there was actually some new thing, some new mysterious object that was causing the discrepancy with the Newtonian prediction. Uh, and we can posit the same thing for our Milky Way galaxy. We can say, well, OK, maybe there's just a lot more stuff out there that we don't see. So it's just a lot more mass. Um, and uh, we're ignorant of this. Uh, because we don't see it. So we come up with the creative title of calling it dark matter because um, it's dark. And um, this slide actually just kind of summarizes what we actually maybe know about dark matter. Um, we put our galaxy here in the center and we draw a big halo around it and we say this is all of the missing stuff. Um, now that trivializes it a little bit, but not actually that much, uh, unfortunately. Um, so many of the, the sort of models that were put out in the 1970s when uh, Vera Rubin's results came out um, for this distribution of dark matter are the same ones that we still use today. Um, and they're very simple. Uh, they're kind of like the simplest model you would write down when you're just starting to figure out how to tackle a problem. So in these kinds of scenarios, the dark matter halo is way larger than the size of our galaxy. Um, in particular, if we were to look at the radius of our galaxy, the visible part of our galaxy, compared to the radius of this dark matter halo, it extends out about 10 times as far, right? So that's telling us that the part that we can actually see is a really minuscule part of everything that's out there in the galaxy. Um, additionally, in these early models, it was just assumed that the dark matter is smoothly distributed, so there isn't really any interesting structure to this. It's just kind of spread out everywhere. Um, and it's actually not moving too fast. So about the speed of the sun, 440,000 miles an hour, 
which may seem fast, but on astrophysical scales is actually pretty slow. Um, so this is kind of boring, right? It's, it's moving around, not that fast, smoothly distributed, um, no preferred direction of the motion. So essentially, you can think of this, if you'd like, as a gas cloud. So um, our galaxy is embedded in this gas cloud where all the little uh, gas particles are zipping around um, not very fast and not with very much interesting structure to it. Um, and so this is the model that's sort of been guiding us for, you know, decades now. And we can ask, well, why do we care sitting here in, you know, this wonderful Aspen evening? Uh, well, we're actually moving through this cloud, right? So you're sitting in this chair in Flugo Auditorium uh, on the surface of the Earth. The Earth is rotating around the Sun, and the Sun is orbiting around the center of the Milky Way. Um, and that just means that we're flying through this massive gas cloud. Um, so in the same way that if you're riding in a convertible and you put down the hood and you feel all of that wind like rushing against your face, that's essentially happening right now. There's a lot of dark matter that's rushing past you right now. Um, and uh, if we were to quantify it, it's about a billion of these particles that are passing through your body every second. So that's an almost uncountable amount. Um, so here's where I actually want to do the first, our first exercise with our handy dandy color cards. So I'm curious what you think of the following. So given the fact that there's so many of these dark matter particles that are flying through you right now, um, if you were to count up all of the ones that were to actually hit something in your body over the course of a year, uh, how many do you think that would be? Uh, do you think it's none? Uh, about 10 to 100, so some tens. A few million or order billions. So I'll give you a second to pick your color. Oh, good. This is green and that's yellow. <laughs> All right. Okay. So let me try to sort of tally tally this up. We are, we are majority blue, billions. We have a few reds and a few greens and yellows. Okay, good. So you've all, you've all made your, um, you've all set your money behind uh, a particular color. So it turns out that it's about 10 to 100. Uh, so um, way less than the number that are flying through your body every second, like orders of magnitude less. This is a ridiculously small number. Um, however, it's not zero. And that makes physicists really excited. Because uh, this gives us hope. This is really hard. Uh, and physicists are stubborn. So even though this is hard, they'll figure out a way to go in and try to find these really rare events. Um, and so that sets us up for the second part of our story today. Um, you know, we're not going to detect dark matter, you're not going to detect it sitting here with your body, but maybe we can actually build something that is an ultra-sensitive detector that can um, notice when one of these really rare events happens, when one of these dark matter particles flies by and hits something. Uh, so, so let's delve into that. Uh, so here, I've now replaced you with a detector. And actually, this is a model of one of the detectors that's currently running. Um, this is essentially a tank of xenon gas. Um, but there's a whole variety of these experiments that have now been designed and are running all around across the world. And typically, um, you put these tanks at underneath mountains or down at the bottom of mines. So if you wanted to go out in search of one of these experiments, that's where you should go to look. And the reason you put these experiments there is because um, these uh, events are so incredibly rare that you need to make sure that you put everything in an extraordinarily quiet environment where nothing's going to happen that could potentially confuse you and think you've discovered dark matter when you haven't actually. So what's actually happening at the fundamental level when a dark matter par particle flies into this detector? Um, and as particle physicists, we don't just want to say it hits something. We want to know exactly how it hits it. Um, and we want to break it down into its most fundamental components of that interaction. Uh, so in the language that we speak, we would be breaking down an atom into its uh, subparts. So looking, for example, at the nucleus. Um, 
but the nucleus is itself not the smallest uh, thing we can make. Uh, we can break this down into protons and neutrons, so that's designated here by the blue and the red uh, balls. Um, but protons and neutrons are themselves not the most fundamental particles that we can get. We can break those down even further uh, into quarks and gluons, which are denoted here as um, the little circles are the quarks and the things that look like springs are the gluons. Um, and as far as we know today, we can't break down quarks and gluons any farther, but who knows, um, maybe, um, maybe we can and that's something that'll be discovered in the future. But for now, these are uh, the most fundamental states that we know of in this picture. So if a dark matter comes in and passes through this, uh, what it can talk to are the quarks. Um, and it, it talks to the quarks actually via uh, the Higgs boson, uh, which you may have heard about because uh, as far as particles go, it's probably one of the most famous ones. Uh, it's been on the front page of the New York Times. Uh, it was discovered at the Large Hadron Collider in 2012. Um, and it's uh, very heavy um, and essentially talks to every other particle we know about today. So you can think of it a bit like a, um, uh, like a Wi-Fi network. So when the dark matter particle comes in, um, it senses the Wi-Fi network. It could send a text message over to the quarks. Uh, quarks know it exists. Quarks text back and tells it doesn't want to be bothered. And so the dark matter just leaves. Um, and so in this way, this Higgs boson can mediate communication between particles, between other stuff that's not even the dark matter and these quarks and neutrons. But because it talks to everything else, it's not such a stretch of the imagination to posit that it's also going to talk with this mysterious form of matter that we haven't yet discovered. Uh, fortunately, when we want to make predictions for experiments and things like that, much of the details of these interactions are actually not that important. And um, this whole process where the dark matter particle comes in and bounces off um, essentially follows any intuition you've had if you've played pool. Um, so if you've hit two balls against each other, uh, especially if they're billiard balls where the collisions are very clean, you have all of the intuition needed to understand what's happening uh, inside these detectors. Uh, so the basic idea is as follows. Uh, we have some dark matter particle, started off way off in our halo, flies in um, through Earth, down beneath our mountain, into our detector, it hits a nucleus. Um, that collision is just like two balls colliding on a pool table. And so the nucleus recoils, bounces off, the dark matter flies off in a different direction. Um, however, unlike the pool example where you can see all of the balls that are scattering against each other, in this case, remember that the dark matter is invisible to us. Um, so if you were observing this kind of interaction, what it would look like to you is some nucleus sitting still, and then out of nowhere, it just starts moving. Um, and it you know, moves off in some direction, and will, you can either see it as like a flash of light, or maybe you'll see it as a very, very small vibration in the detector. Um, this is actually a, a visualization of what this process would look like in a tank of hydrogen, uh, not hydrogen, xenon. I don't know why I said hydrogen. Um, so here's the dark matter. You can't see that technically. But now it's hit a xenon nucleus, and what you're seeing is all of the light created from that collision and that interaction. Um, and so if you surround this tank by really sensitive detectors that can pick up on these flashes of light, you might have some hope then of, of seeing uh, such an interaction occur. So um, the rate at which this happens depends a lot on just how much dark matter is near us, right? So if I imagine my dark matter particle coming in, hitting my detector, um, the, the rate of those collisions will increase if I just have a lot more of the dark matter coming in. Because more come in, more of these nuclei are gonna get kicked. Um, the rate will also increase if the dark matter is coming in at some higher speed. Because if it is, then when it hits the nucleus, it's going to push it with much greater force, and so you'll see like a brighter flash of light. And so it'll be much easier to pick out these kinds of events uh, occurring. Um, and what this tells us then is that in order to understand any results from these experiments, we actually need to know how the dark matter is behaving. We need to know how much of it is near us, and we need to know how fast it's moving. Uh, and these questions may seem like really basic questions, but we have very little idea about them. Um, and if we come back and we revisit our simple model of dark matter in the halo, 
this model is just no longer good enough. Our experiments and all of the technology has improved in leaps and strides. We now have these phenomenal um, uh, collaborations that are running around the world looking for this. We need to be able to provide much more detailed maps of what the dark matter is doing near us so that we can tell the experimentalists, well, you should expect these number of dark matter particles or they should be moving this fast. So that leads us to the last part of our story, which is how we can actually map the dark matter in the Milky Way and improve upon this very simple picture that we started off with and take this to the next level. Um, it turns out that answering this question is really hard. And the reason it's really hard is because it depends on the Milky Way's history. So I don't know if you ever thought about this, but you know, here's our galaxy. Our galaxy wasn't always there. <laughs> how did it get here? Um, and, uh, it turns out it got here in a very complicated way. Uh, and the best way to visualize it is with some simulations. So I'm going to show you a movie of this process occurring for um, some random galaxy. It's very similar to the Milky Way in, in a lot of respects. Um, the movie is going to take 13 billion years and compress it down into a few seconds. So keep that in mind. Um, so we're going to start 13 billion years ago. The, you're going to start seeing some lights show up when I get the movie going. Those are all of the stars. So everything you're going to see is the part that we can actually, it's all the visible matter. You're not going to see the dark matter in this process, but you can imagine it. It's there. It's also sort of going through these violent processes that you'll see. So let me get the movie started. So remember, 13 billion years ago, um, we have these small clumps of stars, and they start merging together. So each of these kind of things that you see flying in are very small galaxies. Um, they fly in, they get pulled in by gravity to the larger galaxy in the center, and then essentially torn to shreds and eaten up. Um, and this larger galaxy, here I'll play that again, the larger galaxy grows by essentially eating up all of these small galaxies that are falling in. Um, so uh, here we go. So again, these are these sort of small satellites. They get pulled in, unsuspecting, dragged in, totally destroyed and donate essentially all of their stars and gas and dark matter to the Milky Way. Um, if we look at all of the little galaxies surrounding the Milky Way today, um, we actually see these things. So it might be, uh, you might have to squint a little bit given the lighting. Um, here's the Milky Way, here's Andromeda, and there's these tiny little specks here. These are these small little galaxies that you saw in the movie, um, the previous slide, um, except this is, reality. So we know that these small galaxies exist, and a lot of these here are actually bound to the Milky Way and in the process of getting pulled in and destroyed. Um, but all we're seeing here is just a snapshot of today. Like if you were to take a photograph today, we're not obviously, we can't see the evolution that got us to this point. Um, the, the most dramatic thing here is actually Andromeda because uh, it's, our, it's our largest neighbor. Uh, it's actually falling in towards the Milky Way. Uh, and is headed actually just on a straight collision course. So Andromeda is going to collide with us in about 4 billion years. The two are going to kind of ricochet off each other and then come back 2 billion years after that and join to form one massive um, new galaxy, which I guess you can call whatever you want, like Milkdromeda or something like that. <laughs> but um, anyways, none of us have to worry about it because there probably won't be any humans on the planet by that point in time, so I think we're safe. Um, but suffice to say that starting from the photograph of our local... Um, outer space neighborhood today and, and pushing it, fast forwarding it and seeing where everything ends up is actually a lot easier task than rewinding and seeing how everything got to this point in time. Um, and that's actually what we want to do. We want to be able to figure out all of the stuff that happened uh, in the past, you know, over 13 billion years that got us to this photograph that we see today. Um, so uh, our task is to build our family tree. Um, and all we know at the moment is we're sitting here, our galaxy is sitting here today. What we want to fill in is all of this space here. Because if we can understand this space, it'll tell us how the dark matter was dragged in, and then we can say something about how it's actually distributed in the Milky Way. So we're going to have to be archaeologists to do this. Um, and our task is actually not too different than what a fossil hunter would go do. So um, somebody who's interested in dinosaurs will go out. Um, search, very rarely we'll find some spectacular new fossil. Um, and then have to extrapolate and make some guesses about the creature that 
was, you know, originally gave you that fossil, right? So based on the shape of this fossil, you would say, okay, well, it looks like a head, it's got some teeth. Based on where in the dirt layer you found it, you can maybe say when the animal was alive. Um, and you might even be able to do some more sophisticated radioactive dating um, to kind of really pinpoint that time period. But it's essentially what you're doing is making, using these observables and making some inference about whatever creature had lived here at some point in the past. Um, and that inference may be right or wrong, it's hard to know. Actually, when I first put together this slide, I had a, a more standard picture of a Tyrannosaurus here. And I showed it to a colleague and he was like, no, 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 um, T-Rex had feathers. And, and that was news to me, I had no idea. And he pulled up a document, he showed it to me, and then he even found me a picture. <laughs> Um, and it, it just provides uh, a nice example, I think, about how when you're making these kinds of inferences, you always need to be revising them as additional evidence comes in, because um, this, is, this is guesswork that we're doing. So taking this analogy and applying it to our galaxy, what we need to do is start off with a map of stars in the Milky Way. Um, and what we want to do is find the really rare fossil stars that originated from some other galaxy a long, long time ago. And when we find these really rare fossil stars, um, we can then start making some inferences about how it got to the Milky Way, and in that way build up the family tree. So in this case, because we're dealing with stars and not bone fossils, um, what we have to work with is the position of the star, its velocity, and its chemical properties. Um, and so taking these things together allows us to make these inferences. Um, and in that way, build up the, milk, the, the family tree for the Milky Way. So we're very fortunate because um, in order to really be able to do this and to do it well, you need to have a lot of stars. Because um, again, these are really rare fossils that we're trying to find. Um, and in 2013, uh, this uh, Gaia satellite was launched. Uh, this is a project from the European Space Agency. Um, and uh, Gaia is set to essentially revolutionize our mapping of stars in the Milky Way. So this movie is showing its launch. Um, here it is opening up. This what looks like wings here are a sun shield um, to protect uh, the main part of the satellite. Um, you see it here going out to its orbit point. Um, so here's spinning Earth, here's the sun, and here's the Gaia satellite orbiting around. Now, the main hub of Gaia here is actually consists of two telescopes. And these telescopes scan the sky, um, measuring uh, stars at, uh, so making repeated measurements of these stars. So in that way, it can actually track how the stars move over a period of time in which it's doing its observations. Um, so Gaia is set to map about a billion stars in the Milky Way, which is about 1% of all the stars that are out there. Uh, and this is just, um, um, far greater numbers than anything we've had to work with in the past. Um, to put this in perspective, I thought I'd show this little uh, uh, graphic um, because you know, the, the desire to, to use uh, information from stars in our galaxy to learn something both about our galaxy and where we fit in it is something that was there from you know, the Greeks. Uh, so, but our ability to actually do these measurements and to do them well has increased dramatically over time. Uh, so on the top row here, this is starting from Hipparchos, so BCE. Um, these fuzzy blobs show the precision with which we, they were able to identify the location of the stars on the sky. Um, and so you can see that moving here, this is 1437, and then going up here, I think that's like early 1800s, um, the, our ability to actually identify the position of the star in the sky improved. So the size of these blobs decreased. Um, by the mid-1800s, the next challenge was identifying how far away the stars were from us. Um, and that's, the errors on that were huge. So these lines here are indicating the errors on these distances. Um, and you can see now as we move to, to more recent times, those errors have decreased. And by the time we reach Gaia, you can't actually see them anymore. Those lines are actually there, but they're so small, they're hidden behind the little star images there. Um, and so it's just kind of spectacular in this context to see how far we've come from you know, the first mappings of the sky, both in our ability to identify the locations of the stars and also to quantify their motions. Um, so with this level of unprecedented data, we can now come back to uh, our question about the Milky Way's family tree and start answering some questions. 
So I'll walk you through two uh, sets of events that uh, we now know have happened. Um, so we've, these are essentially our relatives, so good to get to know them. Um, so here's our Milky Way today. We know that about three billion years ago, uh, it started eating up another galaxy called Sagittarius. And this is a little uh, artistic representation of this process. Um, the Milky Way is still digesting Sagittarius, if you will, so it hasn't completely finished eating it up. Um, and we can see all of this. So here's a, um, a movie I'm going to show you of the Sagittarius galaxy falling in. Um, that's our rotating Milky Way disk. And as it falls in, the gravitational pull from the Milky Way is so large that it just starts tearing Sagittarius to shreds. Um, and uh, because this process is still evolving, we can actually make out all of the stuff, all the stars that have gotten stripped off of Sagittarius in the process. Um, and the Sagittarius galaxy still exists. Uh, it's here, but it won't exist for too long. So if we could fast forward this movie into the future, um, it would make several more orbits and then just be completely disrupted. Um, so I'm curious, um, how many times you think that a star from Sagittarius would end up colliding with a star in our galaxy? So a star in, in the Milky Way disk. So um, we're going to do our handy dandy uh, color cards again. Uh, so the options are, um, it will hardly ever hit a star in the Milky Way. Um, some small chance, maybe 10 or 30 percent. Um, somewhat larger chance, 50 or 75 percent. Or with almost certainty, a star from Sagittarius will end up hitting a star from the Milky Way in this process. Sorry? One star. Uh, one star, yeah. What, what, what's the color? Okay, good. So this is red, green, uh, red, yellow, red. blue. Yeah, I should have chosen better colors. <laughs> Okay, cool. All right, so majority seem to think negligible. We have a few small, 10 to 30 percent. Um, it does turn out that it's totally negligible. Um, and the reason for that is that the stars in both our galaxy and in, in others are, are spaced apart at such great distances um, that essentially when you have these two galaxies pass through each other, the stars just pass right through each other. So any chance for a collision is, is totally minuscule. Um, so that means we don't need to be worried about Sagittarius star hitting our sun or anything like that. Um, but we can ask uh, what happens to the dark matter in all of this process, because the movie I showed you before only showed what the stars were doing. But both our galaxy is surrounded by this massive dark matter cloud, and also Sagittarius is surrounded by this massive cloud. Um, and so here I'm showing you the same uh, two different clouds. Two different yeah, so that we have our own Milky Way cloud, and then the Sagittarius galaxy has its own cloud. And so you can imagine these two clouds sort of passing through each other. And again, the probability of any interaction is really small because it's almost exactly the same as the stars. Um, and so this image here is the result of a simulation that actually tracks what the dark matter is doing. Um, and so you can see, so the, the white part here are the stars that have gotten torn off. That is essentially the movie I already showed you. The darker part is the dark matter. Um, and so we see that like, just in the ma same manner that the stars have all of this interesting structure from our galaxy eating up Sagittarius, so too does the dark matter. Because um, we are inheriting some of the dark matter that's gotten stripped off of this galaxy as it's fallen in. <clears throat> so the study of these stellar streams is an area of very active research. Um, I've given the example I gave you is probably the most spectacular one, um, but there's a, a lot more of these that are actually known. Uh, this, is actu this is data from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey of the northern sky, and um, you can actually see here they're labeled. It's sort of striped with all of these streams. Um, so it's, it's kind of incredible when you look out at the night sky and you see that there's all of this structure that's out there. Um, so here's Sagittarius. It's the biggest one. Um, but there's these other ones here. So this is referred to as GD1 and Orphan. This is Palomar 5. Um, not all of these uh, originate from, you know, will be associated with dark matter, but some of them will. And so we expect that if you were to put on your dark matter goggles and look at the same picture, the dark matter would also be striped in the same way from, from these kinds of merger events. And one of the areas where the Gaia satellite is expected to make some really big 
um, improvements is in, in mapping these streams and, and understanding their dynamics in a lot more detail. Um, so that's a very exciting and very active area of research that's ongoing. Um, but we can also push further back in time. So if we go back now another 7 billion years, um, we know that now there's a, we have an older relative here, so a grandparent, if you will. Um, this was actually only discovered a few months ago, uh, and almost immediately after the second major Gaia data release. So it's a beautiful example of how when you have a big step forward in improvement in observational, um, in observational uncertainties, all of a sudden you start seeing new things. Um, and, and with that step in, in early April, all of a sudden folks were able to make out that there was actually another relative uh, that crashed into our galaxy about seven billion years ago. Um, this one's a lot older. So a lot of the really nice structure that you could see with Sagittarius um, has already gotten washed out with this. So I'll show you a simulation of this, but it's not gonna look as, uh, um, as eye-grabbing as the Sagittarius merger. Um, this is essentially a top-down view of the Milky Way disk, and with the black here indicating all of the stars in the Milky Way disk. And you're gonna see some red clump fall in now. Uh, there it is. Um, and so this is our relative. Fell in, made a few sweeps, got completely destroyed and eaten up, fully digested, unlike Sagittarius. And this is all of the stuff it's left behind, all of the stars. Um, we can look in simulations uh, to try to understand what the dark matter from these kinds of mergers is doing, and the dark matter looks very similar. So again, we, have, we see that there's all of this really interesting structure that's getting left behind by all of these galaxies that the Milky Way ate. And based off of that structure, we can make inferences about our family tree. So those are the two examples I was gonna give you today, but you can see that we're already starting to fill in this picture. And as the data continues to improve, uh, I mean, this is, we're gonna, this, there's gonna be a lot more branches here. It's gonna be, we're gonna fill it in and it's going to be pretty incredible. Um, but even already with these few steps, um, we're already starting to revise our picture of what the dark matter looks like. Because um, now once we understand how things were dragged into the Milky Way, we can map how the dark matter was dragged in. And so we can take our really old model of uh, you know, our original model of the dark matter and evolve it. And we see now that it has all of this incredible structure to it. Um, it's no longer the sort of vanilla picture where you know, it's a kind of like an amorphous glass cloud. In this new, you know, with this new mapping, we see that there are clumps and streams and lots of really interesting features that are there. So this is a huge step forward and is only going to continue to get to improve with all of the advancements coming from Gaia um, in the next few years. Um, so with these new mappings, this fills in a big gaping hole for our understanding of uh, what we expect to see from experiments that we build on Earth. So remember, right, our picture is we're sitting here flying through this dark matter halo um, when some particle flies through Earth, hits a nucleus, we see a detection. Um, now we actually have some much, a much clearer prediction for the properties of the dark matter starting off with. So we have a much better idea of how much of it was there and also how fast it was moving. And because of that, it allows us to make much better predictions and set uh, more detailed sets of expectations for what we'd expect to see um, in light of a discovery in one of these experiments. So if we do discover dark matter in this way, we will have probed its most fundamental nature because we can then end up seeing how it interacts with all of the visible matter that we see today. And that would be one of the first indicators that we've extended our current knowledge of all of the fundamental particles to include um, something new. So this graphic here is showing all of the particles that we currently know of. The Higgs is sitting here in the center. Um, and what we'd ideally like to be able to do after a detection is to add on to this whatever the dark matter particle or particles um, are in this, in this picture. Now, one of the questions I get asked a lot is, how long is this going to take? When are we going to actually discover it? Um, and you know, it's obviously, an, uh, you know, that's going to, it's an impossible question to ask, uh, to answer, but I think we can, we can kind of get a feeling for it by looking back historically at how long it's taken us to discover the other particles that we now know exist. Um, so that's shown um, here. Uh, listed are all of the particles that we know of. 
Um, and this is time, so going from 1880 all the way to 2012. Um, the initial line here is the point in time at which a theorist or multiple theorists predicted that that particle should exist. And then the red bar is when it was actually discovered experimentally. Um, and you can see that there's a huge variation in this. So um, particles like the electron and photon have maybe like 20 year ranges between prediction and discovery. Um, but then there was a period in the 1960s and 1970s where you know, it was only a few years between um, theory and prediction. Um, the, the one here that's uh, lasted, taken the longest and proven, proved to be most elusive was the Higgs boson. So that took about 50 years between um, theory and, uh, and discovery. And in many ways, the dark matter is probably much more elusive than any of these particles for a variety of reasons. Uh, primarily because all of the evidence that we have for it is on large scales from gravity, right? We started off um, talking about ro the, the rotation of the Milky Way and how that uh, tells us about the presence of dark matter. But going from that scale to understanding how the dark matter particle talks on the smallest scales, like at the absolute smallest scales with the quarks, is ranging, I mean, that's a massive, massive range of, uh, of, of scales there. Um, and for this reason, you know, being able to, to do this kind of extrapolation uh, requires really close collaboration between particle physicists and astronomers um, because no one community can actually do this on their own. And in the same way, because we, want it, we need to probe these massive scales, it's not going to be one single experiment that's going to tell us the answer. It's more likely going to be a combination of experiments that we're going to need to run in order to really pin down the, the nature of this <laughs> particle. But um, we're already at a point where many, many of these experiments are running. We're getting a lot of really exciting new data from these uh, astrophysical probes like Gaia, which I described today. And so I think there's a lot of optimism and hope in the community that we're really going to be able to target uh, and identify the dark matter um, soon and, and really um, quantify what its fundamental behavior is. And so hopefully at that point in time, there will almost certainly be another public lecture in this very room telling you about the discovery. So you should stay tuned uh, for that. And hopefully it won't be too far in the future. All right, with that, I'll conclude. But I'm very happy to take any additional questions. Thank you. I mean, I can do it if you don't. Okay. Um, all right. I'll, t I'll take questions. All right. Yes? Is it, is it possible that one day all of a sudden we're going to see a new star pop up right in the middle of everything we already know? Um, oh, you mean... You yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So the question was, is it possible that one day we're just going to see a star pop up um, in the in, sky? In the, like in the field that we've already been looking. Already. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, stars are constantly being born. Um, and so it, uh, you know, especially in, in the Milky Way disk, a lot of the stars are fairly young and, and being born. So it's certainly possible that there will be, like the youngest ones were not, uh, were born fairly, fairly recently, right? Um, so it's, it's uh, that process is, is ongoing. So yeah. Uh, yep. Is uh, either of the data dumps from Gia affirm or question Randall's dark Oh, good. Yeah. Um, perfect. Uh, yeah. So actually, there's been a variety of studies um, uh, using Gaia to, to test. Oh, sorry. Let me reiterate your question. The question was whether or not um, the data from Gaia has shed any light on um, Lisa Randall's uh, model for a dark matter disk. So let me just take a moment and describe what the model is. So in this particular scenario, um, you have more than one dark matter particle, and they can talk to each other. Uh, and when this happens, you have some chance of the dark matter actually forming its own um, disk that's somewhat aligned with the visible Milky Way disk. Uh, and so that's something that you can actually test uh, with data from Gaia. Um, and people have, have, have been doing this. Um, actually, Tong Yen, who's here in the audience, uh, had, a, had a paper out on this. Um, and so the, the result is that it, it's, it's highly constrained. So there doesn't appear to be evi strong evidence for the presence of that disk. Because um, we, can, we can constrain the um, relative overdensity of dark matter in the plane of the disk. And it's, if there was anything there, it would be only 10 or 15% of the total, so a, a small effect. So it, it looks to be pretty, it looks to be tightly constrained. Wendy's not there. <laughs> 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 uh, 
Um, in, its sim in the model simplest manifestation, not there. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yep. But you, you showed a chart that showed the difference between the Newtonian predictions of mm -hmm. the speed of rotation and what actually is, was observed. And my question is, is that difference between Yeah. Is why why is the difference between prediction and observation why does that increase based upon the distance from the galactic center? In other words, if if the amount of dark matter is sort of uniform and in fact the halo mm -hmm. is bigger than the galaxy itself, why should that difference increase based upon the distance from the galactic center? Yeah, that's a really good question. So, so the question here is when we look at the Newtonian prediction, which is in green, and we look at the measured, which is in, um, is in pink, um, and if we interpret the fact that you get this flattening here as being due to a, a massive dark matter halo, why is the uh, distance between the, the pink and the green much larger here at Large, at greater distances versus here near the center of the galaxy. Um, and so the reason for that um, has to do with the distribution of baryons in the Milky Way. So as you go closer to the center, you just end up getting, um, there's a lot more uh, mass of the visible stuff, so the gas and the stars. Um, and relative to the amount of dark matter that you'd also expect from the halo, it ends up giving you a bit of a, it gives you a more comparable contribution um, in the inner parts. But when you go to the outer parts, the amount of stars and gas is a lot, lot less. And so as a result, the, the overall effect of the, the dark matter halo is much bigger. Um, and so there's kind of a transition point where one starts to dominate over the other. Uh, and that transition point is actually different for different galaxies because the distribution of mass in the disk of the different galaxies is different. Um, so it, it's entirely, it, it, it's really set by how the mass how the stars and the gas in the disk are, are distributed. Questions? Um, yep. Does the ice cube experiment help to confirm or help us to time when these other galaxies might have been absorbed by the Milky Way? Or uh, yeah, so, um, so, ice uh, so the question was whether or not the ice cube experiment um, helps to, to tell us something about the formation history of the Milky Way. Um, so Ice Cube is a neutrino detector, and it's in the um, it's in Antarctica, and uh, it's designed to detect really uh, to, to map out where the neutrinos are coming from. Um, and if for some reason the dark matter ends up producing a lot of neutrinos, it's uh, you can actually detect that uh, with Ice Cube. So you can Ice Cube is one of the many of the sort of whole like panoply of different kinds of experiments, Ice Cube forms a critical part because if the dark matter um, produces a lot of neutrinos, you could discover that abundance of those neutrinos with Ice Cube. Um, it, it won't help quite so much in terms of understanding the, the detailed formation history of the Milky Way um, in the manner in which I was describing it here. There, that's really coming from the dynamics of the stars, um, but it is a, a definitely important puzzle piece in, in the search for dark matter because it, it really covers that ground where you have some kind of interaction between the dark matter and the neutrinos. Yep. I think your predictions are predicated on the assumption that the dark matter follows the same equations as ordinary matter. Mm -hmm. what, what is the justification? Is, is that something we know to be true or is that a hypothesis? Great, yeah, so the, the question was in making the predictions in creating this map of, of the dark matter, we're essentially assuming that the dark matter acts very similarly to the stars. Um, and the underlying element of that prediction, I mean, the reason why we, we make that is we assume that the dark matter is not interacting very strongly with anything, um, and that's very similar to the stars. So remember when we had our exercise and I asked you how often you think a star is gonna hit from Sagittarius is gonna hit a Milky Way star, and that was negligible? Um, same thing would have held true for the dark matter. Um, that's the predominant dark matter model. There can also be variations on it. So you can have more complicated scenarios where the dark matter um, 
might behave differently. So if it, if it interacts more, if there's more than one dark matter particle and it interacts, they interact between themselves. And um, I think it's an interesting open question to ask how the story changes. Um, a lot of these simulations are just starting to get to a point where there, we both have stars and like self-interacting dark matter in them. And so that's something that, that I think is going to be addressed in the, the next few years because we'll, we now have the tools to really be able to answer that. Um, I think that's it. Yep. Oh, did I, I miss one? Yeah, there's, yeah. Okay, so we'll, we'll come back. Yeah? How has the possibility been ruled out that uh, dark matter is just normal matter that we can't see, like brown dwarfs? Oh, interesting. Yes. So the question was, um, has it been completely ruled out that dark matter isn't, uh, is not something exotic and is instead uh, something more ordinary, like uh, brown, brown dwarfs? Um, it has, uh, uh, so, most of the constraints from that come from looking for um, sort of massive compact objects. Um, and the presence of those massive compact objects flying around in the halo um, would change the nearby motions of stars. You'd have some lensing effects. And so people have looked for these really small deflections in stars to see if you had these sort of massive dark objects flying by. Um, and those observations have gotten quite good and um, have for the most part um, exclude, like over a, a large mass range, excluded the possibility that those massive compact objects would constitute all of the dark matter. Um, and uh, I mean, I guess it could still it could still be some small fraction of it. But uh, yeah, those those measurements actually, there's some some folks here who have been thinking about using Gaia data to improve on that and, and set constraints. So that's also ongoing, ongoing research. Um, yep. Um, Ranj, will you show the slide uh, where currently? Our Milky Way is kind of swallowing other smaller galaxies. Mm -hmm. Does it somehow affect the Earth and the PS in a good or in a bad way? Oh, does the swallowing of the galaxies affect the Earth? Yeah. Ah, yes, well, that's important. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, so the question is whether or not the swallowing of all of these other galaxies affects the Earth. Um, and uh, for, the, um, for everything I've showed you, the answer is no. Um, and the reason for that is because the galaxies that have gotten swallowed up have been relatively small relative to, uh, um, uh, to the Milky Way. Uh, we can talk about what happens uh, four billion years from now when Andromeda hits the Milky Way. Um, in that case, what's gonna happen is, or what people think is gonna happen based on simulations, is that the kind of rearrangement of the gravitational potential is actually gonna slingshot the sun farther out towards the outskirts. And so, you know, us on Earth, along with our sun, we're just gonna get kicked, kicked out. Again, we don't have to worry about this because we won't exist. But uh, yeah, so for if the, if the merger is large enough and the galaxy that's getting eaten up is big enough, um, yes. But for everything I've showed you, it, like Sagittarius, for example, that's ongoing now and that has no, will have no effect on, on us. Uh, yep. As you approach the galactic center very closely, speeds increase enormously. They don't show up on your slide. Is that because of the scale next to that line? Yeah, yeah. So um, actually, at the, at the very, 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 very center here is a, a black hole. And if you, if you go very close to the center of the black hole, it, the speeds are going to be quite high. But that's just, I mean, that's buried in the, the details of like there on, on these scales. Yeah. Uh, yep. Can you talk a little bit about the uh, nature of the interactions between dark matter and particles? You said they were self Oh, yeah. So the question was um, uh, about how the dark matter particles can interact between themselves. So um, I should start off by saying that the predominant model, so like the kind of the standard one that um, is, is referred to as weakly interacting massive particles, um, usually assumes that there's only one dark matter particle um, and that it, uh, it has, uh, you know, so it's just kind of flying around. It, it, there's no interesting structure. It's only one thing. Um, recently, there's been this, uh, theorists have come up with just a whole host of really interesting new scenarios where um, they're building off of this and saying, well, maybe it isn't just one and maybe it's a lot more than one. And actually, if you think about it, right, when we, when we look at the visible matter, right, it's this beautifully complicated, you know, tons of different particles, they interact in these complicated ways. So it almost seems silly to say that most of the matter out there is only one particle. Um, and so uh, in, these, in these new models that are being developed, um, 
you can have a variety of ways in which the dark matter particles can, you, you can have more than one dark matter particle and they can interact with each other in, in different ways. And it really, it varies a lot from model to model, but um, it ends up giving you a um, whole set of new predictions and things to look for. Um, you mean whether or not they interact with each other gravitationally? Um, so even in the, in the simple vanilla models, the dark matter particles will interact with each other gravitationally. Yeah. Yep. So the matter we're aware of is all organized, and uh, neutron, proton, like mm -hmm. atoms, molecules, et cetera. Is it possible that dark matter is just quarks or whatever that are disorganized? Um, so... As the question was whether or not uh, it's possible that the, the dark matter is similar to some of the particles that we already know of. Is that, yeah, that, yeah? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, you could potentially imagine that we just take a copy of everything we know about um, and, uh, and, and then just say it lives off, it's, it, it, this copy of all of the structure that we see in the visible matter exists also in the dark matter sector, but if that dark matter doesn't, uh, doesn't talk with us in any way. If there's no Higgs, that's, you know, no Wi-Fi network between that dark matter and us, we wouldn't know the difference. So um, it could actually end up looking pretty similar to what we already know. It's just uh, we can't see it. Mm -hmm. But is this precedent in, in normal particle interaction? Yeah, so this is actually, this. Uh, the question was, um, well, it was just to kind of detail this interaction a bit more. Um, so uh, this actually is not a gravitational interaction. Um, so uh, the, the, if, it, if it was gravity, there actually would be a different particle that would be here, different Wi-Fi network in some sense. So the Higgs is, uh, is unique in that respect. Um, it has... Uh, um, the strength with which the Higgs talks with the dark matter is, 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 is greater than what it would be for, let's say, for dark so matter. Yeah, so, so for example, I could also draw the same thing here where I put uh, um, like an electron or something coming, coming off. So, th so th that's what's unique about the Higgs because we know that the Higgs, like I could have replaced this, these two, with any other particle that we know and the Higgs will talk to it. That's why, you know, we make this guess, but it's not a crazy guess because we know that the Higgs can, is already talking to everything else. Yep. The, uh, the dark matter and the ordinary matter uh, produce the same kind of gravitational lensing, or could we tell the difference? Yeah, so the question is whether or not uh, dark matter and regular matter produce the same kind of gravitational lensing. Um, and so, so gravitational lensing is what happens, um, it's actually a prediction from Einstein's theory where if you have um, mass, so let's say some, some massive uh, galaxy or something like that, and something that's um, producing light from behind it, the light bends as it passes by this mass, and what we observe is sort of this bending of the light. Uh, and you can think of lensing as a way of detecting mass. And it doesn't matter whether or not that mass is visible or invisible, it's gonna detect it just the same. And uh, actually, uh, lensing is becoming one of the, uh, uh, there's been just sort of leaps and bounds in terms of what they've been able to do, and we, we have some really great maps of, of the dark matter around other galaxies that's coming from lensing, yeah. Um, yeah, it's actually, uh, well, from simulations, it, it, it looks like if you have every galaxy is surrounded by some massive halo, but then think that there's many millions of these galaxies out there, um, and you sort of zoom out on this picture, what it actually looks like is a cosmic web of dark matter, <coughs> where, uh, so crisscrossed of like filaments of dark matter, and where those filaments kind of cross is where you end up getting galaxies. Um, and so there's this, actually, there's this beautiful structure on very large scales where you zoom out so that you look at all of the galaxies uh, on the sky. Well,